In Memory of Dick Robinson and sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Hello, I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, and I am thrilled to be here today with Lapita Nyong'o, author, Oscar-winning actress, producer, and activist. And she is the author of the number one best-selling book for young people, Sulwe. And it's about a little girl who is unhappy with her looks. And the issue is that she thinks she is too dark. And her classmates tease her and call her names, and she's very unhappy. And as many of you may know, the problem of colorism is very much with us today. And it doesn't just affect children, adults face it as well. So could we start, Lapita, by you telling us about your personal experiences relating to skin color? I grew up in Kenya, which is a predominantly black society, but I still found that there was a preference for lighter skin when my younger sister was born when I was five and my relatives and my family friends would coo and caw at his skin and say how gorgeous she was with her light skin and so my little five-year-old brain took that to mean that my dark skin was not beautiful and it started you know a long journey of feeling inadequate in my skin and trying to change my skin however I could, which includes some of the things that Sue Ray does, like rub off her skin, um, um, pray for lighter skin. I did that. Um, and so I wanted to write a book that addressed the problem of colorism um, and uh, just to, to help younger kids feel beautiful sooner than I did. And so what changed your mind about your self-image? What helped you? Well, for one thing, my mother did not tire of telling me how beautiful I was. And uh, at the time, there were many times when I didn't care to hear it from her because I just didn't feel like she's supposed to tell me that, you know? Right. So <laughs> her opinion wasn't enough. Right. And, but then when I saw... I saw, I remember as a teenager, a distinct moment where Alec Weck was a model that the world was lauding, and she was on the cover of magazines, and she went on Oprah, which I watched religiously, and Oprah was just taken by her beauty and called her beautiful. And that really shocked and disturbed me because she was as dark as I was. And I was like, how come she gets to be called beautiful? But it also planted a seed inside me. If she could be beautiful, then I could stay. I could find beauty in myself too. That coupled with other images of, of dark-skinned people being shown in a, in a beautiful light helped me get to a point where I could claim it for myself. And I have to ask, is it difficult for actors of color in Hollywood to get work? I mean, are there roles, uh, more roles for actors of color opening up? Is there still this typecasting? Because you're right in the middle of this. I mean, you know, it's it's hard to make an assessment um, of, the of an entire industry that is constantly moving. But I will say that now I find there are more of us in in front of the camera than when I grew up, that is for certain. And um, I think where the limitation comes where with who's behind the camera, because we all want to see ourselves reflected. And in the position that I find myself in, in the stories I want to tell, I want it to be a reflection of myself. So what happens if you have a, 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 a only one type of person behind the camera, only one type of person sitting in the executive chair at the studio or, you know, producing writing, you will come, you will find that what's happening in front of the screen reflects them. So I think it's very important for us not just to look at who's, who we are, who's performing 
in in the stories that we're telling, but who's telling the stories that we're telling. Uh. And when that changes, then we'll have a sustainable sense of uh, inclusion and var- var- variety in front of the camera. So that's uh, the producers, the directors, the cinematographers who are lighting the, the scenes. Uh, and especially, I would imagine, the writers. You know, where is this script coming from? Exactly. Exactly. Because they will definitely, writers especially, producers, executives, those are the gatekeepers, really, of the stories that we see told. So it's when those people look like the world we live in, then the stories in front of the camera will also reflect that. Mm-hmm. It's the entire enterprise. So outside of your work, taking roles where you play strong characters, are you doing anything else to affect change because you feel strongly about it? Well, yes, I think um, it, it's... <clears throat> Um, it, it, it informs the projects that I take on um, as a producer. I am a producer of a show called Super Sema, for example, mm-hmm. which is Africa's first uh, kid superhero. Um, and it's about a little Kenyan girl who uses STEM to save the day in, the, in her little town of Guinea. And so there again, I'm hoping that the existence of that will ch- will change paradigms for young kids watching it all over the world. It's on YouTube, and um, also in the, in the projects that I get um, that I that I develop, I make an intention. I intentionally try and hire people um, that look like me. So like the Spoolway audiobook, the design team was black, the director was black, because this is the way in which um, affirmative, uh, affirmative action is a very, very meaningful exercise in order to arrive at equity. Um, so I, I try and do that in those ways. You won an Oscar for your first film, 12 Years a Slave. So how important then is it for people of color to win awards too? Hmm. There's a few ways to answer that question. I mean, there's a, the spiritual perspective or the emotional perspective, personal perspective, but there's also the commercial perspective. The reason why it's important for people of color to win awards is because it indicates value in the market. And so you, if, if you want to see, if, because that's just the way the system is set up, right? And so if we, if, if we want to ensure that... Um, we continue to see certain people reflected, certain stories reflected. It's important they win awards because it sends the message to the, all the, 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 the people in the community that make the decisions that this is actually economically viable. And, and for that reason only, it is important to win awards. Every other reason I find that I personally don't want my value to be, to rely on other people's value of me. It's important to have a, your own well of value that you draw from. And so an award is a lovely garnish. It's one that I welcome, but it is not the main meal. And you've played especially inspirational characters in Star Wars and Black Panther. Did you make a conscious decision before taking on those roles? Was that something you said, I want to play these characters? I would say that because of the way my career began, I have the luxury of choice, which I am so grateful for. I, I am in a position where I can really carefully select what roles I play. And so all the roles I've played thus far have been conscious decisions. I have gone after roles that inspire me, challenge me, whet my appetite, and that I have an insatiable appetite for. So these roles, like Kia and, and Maz and, and Harriet and Queen of Katwe, these are all roles that I, that I felt I was, I was very, very interested. I never got bored with. And uh, that helped me experience or explore a part of myself that uh, mm-hmm. was in some way um, ignored or, or just quieter. And in, in so doing, it gives me more of a, a complex understanding of humanity, which I think is the power of stories, right? 
that we are able to see ourselves in all manner of different character. And we realize, yeah, we're so different, but we're also the same in many ways. And did you have fun too with the science fiction films? We could imagine that was a lot of fun. Black Panther was a, a, a real blast to be a part of. We knew we were doing something different. We knew we were doing something that was going to affect the culture and and um, it was just electrifying every day to go to work. It was also a lot of work. <laughs> and I could say the same for Star Wars as well. <laughs> but still fun. You knew something was happening. Oh, and what yeah. about, yeah. And so with the, with the books and you won a Children's Africana Book Award and inquiring minds want to know, will you write more books for young people? The simple answer is yes. I really enjoyed writing Sulwe. It was not easy. Um, I definitely can't phone a book in, but I really enjoyed the, the, the challenge and I, I want to experience it again. And the theme of our festival is open a book, open the world. And it makes me want to ask you, is there a particular book that opened the world to you? Mm. Well, opened the world. Well, when I was really little, I had a bunch of children's books in Spanish, one of which was a Smurfs book. And I didn't speak a word of Spanish, but I would spend time with this book trying to articulate those combination of letters that I just didn't understand. And I really wanted to understand this book. And so when I was, it gave me a curiosity for Spanish that lasted my whole childhood. And then when I was 16, I got to move to Mexico and learn Spanish. And one of the greatest moments of achievement was coming back to Kenya, finding that book and finally understanding it. Oh, that must have been wonderful. And this conversation has been such a pleasure. I'm afraid we're running out of time, but I want to do ask you something about your Solway um, and the fact that you tackle uh, issue that young people are dealing with, as we said, even adults. And do you feel op opening the world, books open the world and all of that, but do they also give you a sense, and that's what you get in your book, of what you're going through and it's important? Yes, I think it is, it is invaluable to find a book that resonates with your experience um, in uncanny ways. And that can happen where you're reading someone else's story and you cannot believe how it relates to you. That I felt that way when I read Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Americana. I felt like she was, she had, she had stolen my diaries, <laughs> you know, in many mm -hmm. moments. That book, like she's definitely stolen my diaries. But, um, um, and that feeling is so valuable because you feel more connected with the world around you when that happens. Um, and for children's books, um, I think it's they. This is it's such a great place to um, plant ideas for kids, but also to have them feel to, to have them relate. Little people have big feelings, mm -hmm. and children. Um, can I, it's it's important to have children's books that oh, that embrace the big feelings and explain the big feelings and allow for the big feelings to be felt, um, because it it validates a child experience and can actually help them get through um, the difficult things that they may be experiencing. And kids do experience difficult things, and it shows respect for their feelings as well. True, and they. True they know that they're being shown a way to deal with them. Well, thank you so much for being part of the 2021 National Book Festival. And I and so many other people look forward to seeing much more of your work. Thank you. Thank you. This has been amazing. 
it's an honor to speak to you, Dr. Hayden. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation, and now we'd like you to hear more from the library's own experts on this topic. Hello, and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Danny Thurber, and I'm a reference librarian in the Hispanic Reading Room, where I serve as the reference specialist for Mexico, Central America, Ecuador, and U.S. Latinos. As a librarian in one of the world's largest libraries, I assist users in navigating our amazing collections, helping them find what they are looking for and make connections in the reading room and online. The Hispanic Reading Room is the primary access point for research related to the Caribbean, Latin America, Spain and Portugal, the indigenous cultures of those areas, and people throughout the world historically influenced by Luso Hispanic heritage, including Latinos in the United States. Raised in Kenya, award-winning actor, producer, and children's book author, Lupita Nyong'o, was born in Mexico City, and even returned there later in her youth to study abroad. Her name, Lupita, is a diminutive of Guadalupe, a traditional name in Mexico, most famously associated with the religious Marian apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. In the library, we have a wonderful selection of images of La Morenita, or Dear Brunette, as the image is colloquially known in Mexico due to the mestizo indigenous features of the woman depicted. The image has also gained significance in the Latinx communities throughout the United States as a symbol of devotion, identity, and even resistance. Many artists and activists inspired by the image have created their own rendition, such as Chicano artist Juan Fuentes' vibrant representation on silkscreen, or visual artist Esther Hernandez' La Ofrenda Dos, depicting a Chicano woman's back with an image of the Virgin of Guadalupe and a hand offering a rose. Many believe that the power of the Guadalupe devotion derives from the apparition story, which is closely tied to the image of a pregnant woman appearing to an indigenous peasant to perform a miracle. Devotees are drawn to the image and story because it represents them. Latinos all around the world connect with La Morenita's indigenismo. Representation is important and children's stories such as Lupita Nyong'o Sole have an incredible power to share truths about everyday struggles experienced by people of color. I invite you to view other wonderful children's and young adult books which we collect at the library, such as Silly Recios, If Dominican Were a Color, Grace Byers, I Am Enough, Cosby Cabrera's My Hair is a Garden, and Junot Diaz, Island Born, just to name a few from the many others in the library's collections. Or to learn about the library's Luso Hispanic treasures, reach out to the Hispanic Reading Room and we'll be happy to answer any questions.